Joining me today on the Uniweb interview show, Cheryl Lawson, author of We Are Mars, joins me. Cheryl, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's awesome to finally get to talk to you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I can't say that I wasn't a little nervous about coming on, but I'm here. Okay. It's understandable. I'm extremely intimidating. Um, <laughs> You're terrifying. That's right. I. Uh, what you can't see right now in the camera is the gun that I was I was waving in front of <laughs> Cheryl <laughs> before the interview started. I told her if she doesn't do a good job. <laughs> That's right. No, this is awesome. Thank you so much. It looks like um, you're you're recording in your your office here. I see a lot yes. of post-it notes in the background. Yeah, those are my timelines for my my books. Um, if I don't have it like that, I'm a, I'm a visual person. So if I don't have it where I can see it and refer yeah. to it, if I've got a a snag in my story, then uh, then I'm a bit stuck. So it's got to be where I can see it. That looks incredible. I thought it was just like a list of chores you had for your husband. Um, huh? That's <laughs> no, that's in the kitchen. <laughs> that's in the kitchen. Is the is it the is the wall as big? Is there as many? things to do in the house as there is in your book um it, it kind of goes around and down the stairs <laughs> oh my god um, no he'll never be it's done not <laughs> it's not that bad not that bad he knows what he has to do if that's he doesn't right. get it done well oh well he's in trouble he's been trained well um no i'm excited to have you on the show we've talked on twitter a lot uh we are mars is uh your first published book correct mm -hmm. uh First published novel. Novel. You had a novella before? No, I had a nonfiction book. I actually don't have one handy, but I wrote a creative manifesto. Ooh. That yes, was kind funny. of like the mind dump to get past all of the creative thinking and clear my head. That's interesting. It's, yeah. it, it is like a mind dump. It was a bit of a mind dump. It was like, well, how do I do this? Why do I do it? What's the point? And yeah. I got it all out, and then I had space for being creative again. Right. Because I was getting too tied up in the process. Yeah, I think, um, and that's a, that's an awesome point for any writer out there. Like, if you're stuck, just, I use this a lot, and it sounds like you, you do too. Just like write all the stuff inside of your head that like, because I, I talk to myself really badly when I can't write and I just write it all down. Okay. And then once it's like starts filtering out all the bad stuff and I and I feel myself, I'm like, all right, take it easy, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> this is a bit harsh. And then it starts getting nicer and nicer. And then I'm like, there's nothing left. And then all the creative stuff comes out. Yeah. Well, that self-talk, the, the more negative it is, the harder it is to be creative. Absolutely. Um, that's what um, I realized going through that process. And it was it was almost like a psychological process for me. It was like, why do certain things? Mm -hmm. I can't do other things. Where the scripting comes from? Who are the little voices in my head? Yeah. And figuring all of that out and actually writing it down was very cathartic. Mm. Absolutely. Is that so? We are Mars. Is that the the baby of the your nonfiction manifesto? Yeah, pretty it much. Poured, yeah. Poured out the, of you afterwards. We are Mars is the first one in a series. So the whole story, um, the entire thing, will be what as a result of being able to clear my head and get it out. Of can you? Sorry. Can you show? You want to show the book? Sure. For people who haven't seen it, We Are Mars. Beautiful is it the right cover. Way around? Yeah, it is. Okay. It is definitely very, very nice. I love Thank the cover. You. Thank you. So what is We Are Mars about? It's a settlement on Mars um, a couple decades into the future and a couple decades into being settled. So, uh -huh. you know, at this point in time, Earth is losing interest in what's going on up there. The settlement is being run almost independently, but they still have mission oversight. And it's getting harder and harder to get supplies up to them, the budget cuts and all that sort of thing. And yeah, yeah. Um, they, it starts off in that sort of mode where you kind of see the sort of everyday life of these people. There's two sets of people. Um, one are genetically modified 
and almost specifically grown to be there, and others are natural born um, against the rules. They've come into being and they, they tend to be more independent, more rebellious, that sort of thing. Just by nature, they are that way. And uh, so it kind of sets the scene for these two groups of people to either work together or work against each other and through a series of crises that, that evolve mm -hmm. from various plots and evil plans that are on our foot. Evil plans that are afoot. So was there, um, while you were writing this, was this, you said it was cathartic to get it all, all this stuff out too. Like, was there a question you were asking yourself, like an overarching, arching question of where you wanted to go? Because you said this, this is a series, right? This is yeah. a three book series. Yeah. Did you know from the very beginning, this is going to be three books? I wouldn't say from the very beginning, because I didn't really plan it as a, a series what I did was I I built out the plot and when I kind of filled in the the main points of each of the the plot points that I'd worked out I realized it's going to be too much for one book mm -hmm. and um then I thought okay well I don't know if I'll have enough space to do it into two and it it evolved into a three book thing um, and it gives me the space to develop the characters as well and mm. introduce new characters and nuances and things like that, challenges and so on that they face in the second story. Um, I mean, I could go on at infinite and with the, with the problems, you know, the, the way sci-fi series sometimes do. They just keep facing yeah. problems over and over again. But I thought three is enough. Um, get them to a logical conclusion at some point. Um, yeah. and then move on to another set of stories, I guess. I have no idea what I'm doing after this. no clue? <laughs> nope. It's hard. That's hard. That's a hard thing to figure out too, right? Because, um, you, you just finished the second story. It's in revisions and all that kind of yeah. stuff right now, right? Yeah. Isn't there a point where you're writing a series and you're like, invested in these characters and you fall in love with them and you just like want to want to know that their life turns out okay like is there a part of you that's thinking what happens when i get to book three and i write it am i gonna murder all these wonderful characters <laughs> <laughs> like how because that's a real question right like what do we do with our babies like yeah you know? no I, I i know what you're saying um don't kill them i guess that's not <laughs> If you haven't read We Are Mars, you'll you'll know you'll not know about my dark side. I like to kill my babies. Oh my god! <laughs> so book three could go either way, Matt. Yeah, I'm just saying. I don't. I, I have an idea for a couple of them, and um, may or may not be a popular choice with my readers, but there are plans. Yeah. Some people are definitely not going to make it to the end. Oh, my gosh. That's exciting, <laughs> though. You know, I mean, that happens in life. Like, who knows if I'll be here tomorrow? Let's um, try and keep it as realistic <laughs> as possible because like the... realism is what makes the story believable. Right. Yeah. And people die every day. Unfortunately. Yeah. Or fortunately. Depending on the person, of course. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Getting into that one. I like to make it dark. I like to get the conversation really dark and <laughs> toward the other person is like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What was the inspiration for We Are Mars though? Like what was the was there like were you on like a train or were you walking down the street and you saw something and you're like, wait a second. Um, there was no kind of lightning bolt moment, but um there had been at that point in time, quite a lot of development around the idea of colonizing Mars. There still is. But at that point in time, people like Elon Musk had made bold statements about colonizing Mars by 2030. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's the whole renewal of the space space age, the space dream right. um, to, to go beyond where we are now and to kind of become masters of the universe 
sorry. Yeah, I like He-Man. But, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, it was like, well, okay, so we've all colonized everything, but what happens after that? What happens to the people who are there? What is their story? And yeah. it, it kind of made me think that's actually a good place to start. I didn't want to start with the colonizing because there's been a lot of stories like that already. I wanted to right. start into it knee deep in the the trash and the the rubble and everything else of, of being there every day. Yeah. What did you discover? I mean, what like because I can imagine it'd be hard to make uh, something that's not extremely earth like, you know, like making something that's just like oh it's just another earth, another planet earth kind of deal um to where we just kind of ruin everything or whatever and <laughs> and they were like well i heard jupiter's nice Let's yeah. go check out. <laughs> well one of the things that these people have discovered well not discovered but they know it because they've grown up there is that mars is extremely deadly it's mm. it's an unforgiving environment and even a small mistake can cascade into a series of deadly events. Mm. And okay. that, that comes across in the story. They make mistakes. They're, they're very human, even though they don't live on Earth. They, they're flawed, um, un, un, um, imperfect, imperfect human beings. And they make mistakes. They make the wrong choices. They make bad decisions, and all of that kind of is snowballing the whole time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mars is not the kind of place you want to be making small mistakes that could cost you your life. So. Yeah, you'd be making bad decisions on Mars. You won't be <laughs> making bad decisions for long, right? Yeah. But they've also got additional trouble to to deal with and that um there are forces at play that don't want them there anymore and the ancient are... alien forces no i decide that the best um antagonist for mars is earth mm. okay so there are people on earth that are bent on their destruction. Wow. So it's an Earth versus Mars, but Mars are the good guys kind of scenario. Very cynical, I know, but amazing. Yeah. Just but we so basically humans left Earth. Only the good ones left Earth. They left all the jerks behind. <laughs> no, there's and Earth is just like Screw most... you Mars. <laughs> um what's 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 uh, what separates these people that are on Mars from the people on Earth is the fact that most of them are born there. Okay, okay. so that is why the book is called "We Are Mars." Yeah. That's all they know. They wouldn't be able to exist on Earth because of all of the the differences in the environment. Mm -hmm. They exist there because they're designed to exist there. They would never be able to come to Earth. So they've literally evolved, or they were they they were genetically uh, genetically modified. Modified to. Okay, the, I stretch I stretch a lot of those scientific truths. Sure. Um, they they live underground. Mm -hmm. In in a city that's built into the volcanic um, lava tubes. Oh. Right. So um, they're safe from things like radiation and what have you, but. I had to invent gravity, some form of gravity, because there's no grav there's virtually no gravity on Mars. Um, it's okay. a pressurized environment, there's airlocks and all that sort of thing. So they they exist there, but they would never be able to exist outside of that environment. Ah. So they don't even get to like they get to see they don't get to see the sun or anything like that? Or are they like in a domed environments? They or? are um domed atriums throughout the city okay. there's about four or five of these domed atriums where the dome there's a tube that goes all the way up and they get some light coming down a gotcha. kilometer or two however deep they are underground um so they get some natural light but for the most part 
no one ever sees the surface. They mm. live underground. Um, there's a small handful of people that go up to the surface and maintain surface works like um, water filtration systems, electric and so on. All of their stuff is up on the, the top. Did uh, you change the actual appearance of the characters that live on Mars? Are they like adapted to living underground and that kind of thing? Or no, they're very human. Very human. Okay. Um, they're not like mole people. <laughs> no, and they don't have weird skin color or gills or anything like that. So, no, they're very human. Um, they aren't any animals. That's one distinct difference is there are no animals. Um, there's no insects. Any of the insects that are there are nanobot insects. Oh, wow. To, to pollinate the crops. So they're all vegetarians or vegans. Yeah. Pretty much the poor sods. It's no wonder they're so upset. <laughs> no wonder what else was going on on Mars. <laughs> just send a, the Earth could just send a cow up there and ruin everything. Totally. <laughs> it's like what? you tried one you cow had a hamburger before. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh my god. <laughs> no, everything is soy based. Um, uh, so they eat yeah. all soy proteins and protein shakes and all that sort of thing. The food is actually one of those things that I do talk about. So. Wow. Yeah, I mean, because I, I suppose if you're going into colonization and all this kind of stuff on another planet, I mean, that's a pretty important part of yeah, it's <laughs> society. It's, it's food, it's sanitation. One thing somebody said to me is like, and they don't recycle their water. I'm like, mm. don't mention it, but I'm pretty sure they probably do. I don't mention it, but they use glacial water. There's these underground okay. glaciers that, that feeds their water system. So, you know. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, there's no atmosphere that would create water. Um, there's like no it does liquid water. Earth. Yeah, there's no liquid water on Mars and on the surface. Um, right. But there might be ice made from liquid water. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't contain the same chemical balances that water here on Earth would. The glaciers have to be filtrate filter, filtered and, and put through a whole big system so that it's safe to drink and use and everything else wow. in my book that is right and not in real life <laughs> i don't even know if this glacier is there i'm just assuming they are from my research so yeah i mean it's it's fiction this isn't <laughs> just make it it's whatever. science fiction science fiction just yeah. stretching the truth i mean that's what makes it exciting our yeah. um like the the guy who wrote We Are Mars, or not We Are Mars? Wow, that's the guy who wrote John Carpenter. Um, yeah. He wasn't. He never went to Mars. He doesn't know. What it's like. Oh well, <laughs> I mean, look at look at Andy Weir's um, The Martian. Yeah. With, what's his name? Uh, Mark uh, Watney. It's left behind. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he gets to experience living there for I can't remember how many months it was by himself eating potatoes. Yeah. You know, in a hab in a habitat that's on the surface. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that stretches the truth a bit. So if Absolutely. he can do it, I can do it. Yeah, he can do it. Um, so inspirations, like who who inspired you to start writing, and when did you start writing? It's not like I could write my name when I was in, you know. Yeah, no, I, I know what you're <laughs> Uh, writing, I just, I kind of came by it. It, 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 it's something that I've done for a while in different forms, like, oh, probably going back 20 years now, the, one of the first jobs that I had, um, I was the editor for a, a small in-house magazine for an insurance company. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had a set of articles that I had to write. I wrote articles about technology. So I was the technology reporter or journalist. Um, I wrote the editorial. I wrote an entertainment page and I did a feature on a staff member each month. And we put one of these newsletters out every month and I did probably about 40 editions of that. So that was kind of one of the starts. Yeah. For me, I didn't even really think about it as, you know, it was one of my jobs I had to do when I was the graphic designer at that particular company. It was one of the things that I did. I didn't think about the writing part as being 
writing. It was just something I had to do. Right. Um, and then uh, moving on from there, hazard. I did. What's that? Occupational hazard. Occupational. <laughs> you know, You're writing a lot of copy and things like that for marketing material and um, for advertising messages and that sort of thing too. Um, you know, we had to do creative writing as part of our graphic design course when I was at college. Um, because when you're writing copy, you've got to sell products. So your your copy has to be strong and convincing and all that sort of thing. So we had to do a lot of that sort of thing at college. Mm. When I was at high school, I read poetry and maybe a few short stories and things like that. I submitted a short story for an English competition once and got a honorable mention. So yeah. I guess it goes back, but it was never really something that um, I saw as a career path. Mm. And then a few years ago, this the creator manifesto I mentioned to you, I'd sort of reached a very distinct roadblock in my career as a designer. And um, I'd tried photography for a while and I tried art for a while, um, doing um, watercolors and sketching and that sort of thing. I just wasn't finding anything that I could get traction with mm -hmm. um, that made me feel like I was, I had a purpose. And uh, I kept complaining about this to my husband and saying, hey, it's a process and it's this. And he's like, just write it down. And I wrote it all down to kind of get it out of my head. And when I looked at what I had, I'm like, holy cow, this is enough to put into a book. Mm. So I assembled it into what I thought a book should look like. This is what books look like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm a designer. I've put books together for other people. I know what I'm, I think I know what I'm supposed to be looking at here. <laughs> I sent it off to an editor and she uh, um, gave me her feedback and comments and helped me figure it all out. And I thought, okay, well, you know, nothing left to do but push the publish button. And I did. And crickets. Mm -hmm. Nothing, because I didn't know how to market it. I mean, my entire career in advertising and marketing, and I had diddly squat in terms of marketing a book knowledge. I had right. nothing. Anyway, so I'm like, okay, well, it's out of my system now at least. Just put it to one side and focus on other stuff. Mm -hmm. Now I think I know what I want to do with my life. And I you know, start, sat down and started working out these ideas for writing books and came up with this one. I'm like, okay, I've got another book here. Said and I did it. <laughs> sent it off to an editor, got it back, sent it off to some beta readers, and someone's like, Holy cow, this is a good story. You're going to publish this. How are you going to publish this? I'm like, I'm not good enough. This is not good enough to send to a publisher. I'm just going to self publish because I don't know anything about the publishing industry. I don't know how to query. I don't know how to get an agent. I don't know nothing at this point. Like, yeah. I'm novice. I am even still today, I'm like, just barely above novice level, all right? Yeah. Uh, I, there's a lot of days when I don't call myself a writer because I can't actually, it's like that imposter syndrome is so strong. Yeah, but anyway. I know how many books you sold, so it's all bull crap. <laughs> Thanks. But, you know, for me, that's like, I had bigger goals than that. I have to tell you, my first goal for sure. selling books was 5,000. Mm. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'm not even close. I, no, I get it. Sure. You yeah. Know, <laughs> because I had you can't sell 5,000 without selling one, right? Yeah. Well, one was enough. And I got a lot of good feedback. And that, that reader's review, um, five star, or reader's yeah. favorite five star review, little award was something very special for me because it gave me the affirmation that I needed to, mm -hmm. to carry on. And, and, you know, I'm a storyteller. Um, from the time I wake up to the time I go to sleep, I have to struggle not to talk my husband's ear off, for starters, or anyone else will stand still long enough to listen. Yeah. So yeah. I'm like channeling that into writing and trying to learn industry, navigate my way around the publishing industry. So right. Self-publishing is a good way to go to start with because – as I say, I knew nothing, and it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to see what other people are doing, what the do's and don'ts are, and to to build community. 
Yeah. It's, yeah. Self-publishing is, is difficult. And it's, it's funny you're talking about being in advertising and marketing for so long. And then you had your book. It's almost like we do it. Cause I was in the same thing, sales and marketing and all this kind of stuff. And I'm so, I'm so used to doing it for other people, like selling somebody else's product. Like yeah. even now, like, my whole platform is really like helping other people sell their yeah. books. I was going to say, you haven't changed much. <laughs> I know, I, but it's like the, my, the way your brain is so hardwired to think, like when it comes to something that you've done, you're like, nobody wants what I've done. Yeah, what am I? that's it. Yeah. Like, honestly. If because I, it's not I, special, right? It's like, yeah. I, it's not special. I did it. It can't be special. That's the thing, and and that's what I was saying earlier before we started the the recording. Is like that negative um, self talk. Yeah. If you do too much of that, you're never going to believe that you can accomplish this yeah. this thing. And a book is a major accomplishment. Absolutely. Having gone through a few of them now, I'm like, I don't know if I can do another one, and then I do, and then I'm like, I don't know if I can do another one, and the whole time there's that negative talk, negative talk coming at me in my little head. All those voices saying, you're not worth this. You can't do this. You're an imposter. You shouldn't be here. You should be doing something else. Go back to doing whatever, okay? Yeah. The whole time those voices are coming at you. Mm -hmm. And you have to be like schoolmaster about it and say, shut up. I'm doing this. That's Sit right. down. Sit down. And, shut up. and you know, some days are worse. Because we, yeah, because we will lose our minds. Our it's like our ego is so big and atrocious that it's like it thinks it's the world. And then when somebody looks at it, I, I said it was like this. It's like the wave and the particle thing with light. It's like we're our egos like that. It's it's huge and big and amazing. But then when you look at it, it totally it's like no, don't look at me. <laughs> it yeah. freaks out. It's like oh, it's like it's a wave. And then it becomes a particle as soon as you as soon as you observe it. it just our brains and our we're just I know because I'm I'm an insane person too, and that's basically like my whole my whole next book is basically just all the neuroses of a writer poured out onto a page because like we just want to we want to be accepted so bad, or I, I want I'll speak for myself I want to be accepted very badly. <laughs> I do too. Why my book? Why my book? <laughs> yeah that's right we want to be accepted and then like we get our chance to show people who we are and then we're, i'm just like don't look at it I don't, I'll, oh. it'll never work it'll never work when you first asked me to come on this uh when you texted me the other day i'm like hell no you want me <laughs> to sit in front of a camera and and other people are gonna see this no nope. yeah nope and and i had to actually be convinced Someone had to say to me, just do it. Mm -hmm. What's the harm? That's right. You know, and it's the same with pushing that publish button. It took me three days yeah. to get to the point where I was like, put, make it live. And yeah. then there are so many days since then that I've wanted to pull it and say, no, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I got some negative feedback about how I needed to clean up the editing and everything else. And I was very disappointed because, you know, not knowing enough about what I needed to put out there, I put out a book that in my head I felt uh, on a scale of 1 to 10 was maybe a 3. Mm -hmm. It was a disaster. It was a dumpster fire. And I put it out there and I felt awful. I really did. Yeah. But then I got a five-star review, and then I got a four-star review, and then I got another five-star review, and it just kept adding up. And I'm like, okay, other people are liking this, so it can't be that bad. Mm -hmm. And then somebody did a video review. I don't know if you know Quinn Buckland. He's on, on Twitter as well. On Twitter. Mm -hmm. Another Canadian author. He did a video review that like, just made my year. That's it. If, if no one else ever reviews my book again, I've got that one. It was yeah, the yeah. nicest stuff anyone's ever said about anything I've produced in my whole yeah, life. Yeah. My whole life has been about people criticizing what I do. And Quinn just kind of blew that all away. Mm -hmm. He's like, if you ever read a book, you must read this one. And he was so enthusiastic. 
in his review of it. I'm like, I'm good. I don't care if it sucks for everybody else. This is all I need. That's so beautiful. It was it was the best review I've ever had, and it sticks with me because it was so sincere. Isn't it? It is mind blowing too when you think back to like sitting behind the computer, writing something, and being like, oh, "This is crap." And then getting it out there uh, and having somebody across the world or like another country read it and be like, I yeah. love this. This yeah. is amazing. Yeah. It's just like, wait a second. What just happened? Yeah. It's, the it's, that... an, am- it's yeah. an amazing thing. It's, it's such an amazing thing. It's, it's mind blowing. I get goosebumps talking when I, when I mention yeah. it because it's like, how? How? How is this possible? I think yeah. for me, the people that um, I fear that criticism and, and review process from the most are people that know me. Um, mm-hmm. My oldest sister, uh, she lives in France, and she had a, a paperback copy of my book. She gave it to my one cousin. Mm-hmm. Um, and this cousin is one of those very hoity-toity types. And I was like, why did you give it to her? <laughs> oh my god I can't she's a monster <laughs> she's got a copy of my book please why did you do that and Melanie yeah. my, Melanie is like it's alright she was very enthusiastic about having it so I'm like <sighs> yeah because I know there's going to be that judgment those oh, people yeah. those people closest to you when that judgment comes it hurts the most yeah so. and I think I think too and I, I noticed this with my dad um when I, I gave him a copy of my book, he got six pages in before he called me. And like me and my dad don't talk. <laughs> okay. He called me. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, Hey, uh, some things about the book. And like, he pointed out like three things, errors. And I was like, you know what? Just read the book. If you like the story, tell me. But the thing I thought I was like, okay, that obviously sucked for me. It hurt. Yeah. But what if he's worried about how he looks like in relation to his son writing a book? Like it's it's and it's still again, it's like I'm I'm obviously associated with this person. My last name is on this book. <laughs> and if there are any mistakes, it reflects back on me. Yes. You know, and it's like, okay, so it's not necessarily a me issue, it's a them issue. And just have to take it with a grain of like, okay, it's it's yeah. Everything's fine. It's going to be well, fine, even dad, though it hurts. My dad was much the same way, and he's been one of my top critics my whole life. Yeah. He's always that voice at the back of my mind going, um, is this the best you could do, right? Yeah. Um, yep. I'd, I'd, come home, I'd come home with a report card, and I'd be crapping myself because that report <laughs> card is not going to be received well. Mm-hmm. E's and C's. Did not go down well, yeah. and I wasn't. I wasn't a an A student. I was never an A student. Yeah. Anyway, and my dad said to me the one day we were talking on a Skype a few months back, um, and it was actually one of those days when I was like, oh, "Screw this! I'm going to take it all down," because of what he said to me. Um, mm. So he wanted to know where he could buy my book. Can he buy it in the bookstore? Now they live in South Africa, so. Those bookstores will only have stuff on their shelves that, you know, they know they can sell in that market. And I said, no, right. you need to order it from them if you want to get one. You need to order it through the counter. Go to the counter and order it. He's like, well, why isn't it on the shelf? Speak to your publisher and get them to put it on the shelves here. I said, Dad, I am the publisher. I self-published my book. Oh. Oh. Okay. Why did you do that? I said, because I wanted to. Yeah. And from that moment on, I mean, he just took my big balloon of happiness that I had at that point. I mean, yep. pop. Pop. And I, was, mm. I was so mad at him and I was so deflated. I'm like, I'm wasting my time. I might as well take it down because even now when I've done this thing, he mm-hmm. still can't see it for the value that it has. Yeah. I know, and it's the it's there's so many people like that. It's not mostly our dads, but (laughs) (laughs) but 
there's so many people like that and it's not because there's anything wrong with us writing and self-publishing it's because it, they never did it <laughs> you know more than it, like well, him it said he can't brag to his friends oh my sure. daughter how does it make me look right yeah. Yeah, it's such a it's such a narcissistic thing. <laughs> but that's Absolutely. him. Yeah, my dad. I feel like we have the same dad. We might be related. Jeez. Wait, what's your dad's name? No, <laughs> I know my dad got around a lot when he was no, there. <laughs> but I know, that, and that's you know, it's not just it's not just our dads. We joke around, but it's like there are people like that all the time. And we talked about this a little bit before the interview. If it's not done this way, yeah, how it's supposed how it's supposed to be done, yeah, then you might as well not even do it. But I think and I've I've shared my sentiment with you, and I've shared it with um, Twitter and whoever will listen. If you've got a story to tell, tell the damn story because somebody yeah. needs to hear it. Yeah, it's not a, it's not about like, well, you better go through these channels. Well, what if somebody across the country or in another, you know, across the world? needed to hear your story that day connect with something that was in it but because you i was because i was stuck on query letters or like nobody will publish me or, or there's too many grammatical errors they never get to hear that story no. and they something in their life doesn't happen because of it you know what i mean it's like get out of myself stop thinking so much about i have to look perfect because yeah it's not about I, the process it's about the story and yeah, that absolutely. the fact that uh, indie publishing has democratized that process mm -hmm. is is massively unpopular with a lot of people in the yeah. industry because they see it as a as a dilution of their efforts. They see it as a um, a threat to yep. the industry, and I I couldn't agree less. Yeah. I think that it's a, an amazing way for so many more original voices to be heard. Yeah. Wasn't it crazy to think like it, it, we could delude the market? Like, don't people still have free will to choose what they want to read and what they don't want to read? Like, pretty much. And <laughs> when we don't they... have the marketing power that those big publishers do. Yeah. So, how do we get the New York Times to review our little book? Right. You know, we don't. Yeah. We yeah. we yeah. use Twitter, right. we yeah. use Instagram, we use YouTube. Whatever means we can or have at our disposal to get our message out there that, yeah. hey, I've got the story. You might like to read it. Yeah. And then it's still up to that person. And, and it's it's all about building that relationship with somebody and realizing that it is all about the story. Like, yeah, I'm not reading a book to learn how to learn how to use a semicolon. I'm not <laughs> reading a science fiction book to learn how to use a semicolon. Oh, I'm reading it because, uh -huh. yeah. I have still have no clue how to use one. Um, I'm learn I'm reading a science fiction book because I want to hear the story. I want to I want to feel what these characters are feeling on Mars. The Chicago Manual of Style. There's what's the other one? What's the other one? Uh, I don't know. I don't either. That's the <laughs> one sure. that I use because I don't know where to put the damn Oxford comma. There's there's a, there's some great editors out there for the writing community too. Yeah. Uh, I have to shout out my editor, JM Brister's doing a great job for the writing community. She does yeah. it for a very reasonable price. Um, but because we have to we have to find resources <laughs> as independent authors. Like you've got a beautiful cover on yours too. Did you um, did you find somebody in the community to make your cover? Or did you make it yourself? I made my own covers. It's beautiful. Well, that's my graphic design background. And, you know, for me, it's like if I can save some money yeah. and, and put it together myself. I nearly had a heart attack last week because I was looking at the um, um, the royalty, oh, not the royalty, sorry, the, the image rights, the usage. And I misread how I'm allowed to use the images. And I'm like, oh, no, I didn't buy the right version of the, the um Yeah. The rights. Yeah. So I'm yeah. like, oh, how many books have I put out there and I'm not using the, the pictures right and, you know, freaking out about that sort of thing. And, but yes, I do it myself because I know I can save myself some money. And they may not be super fantastic, wow, like HarperCollins style covers, but they do the job. They're nice. And even that, the like copywriting laws for, uh, even for places like Canva and stuff like that where you can make your own covers. Yeah, they're so 
confusing. That it's confusing like, what in the hell am I? Yeah. The problem with copyright is it's different in every country. Okay. Okay. But you've got to remember that where those pictures come from or where yeah. that top font comes from, um, all of that, where it comes from is the jurisdiction that you'll be prosecuted in if they get you. Okay, like yeah. that's the part that freaks me out the most before I hit that buy button to to purchase an image on iStock Photo or or wherever. Yeah. And it's difficult to to know where that line is. And and I've done copyright stuff before. I did a lot of things with copyright back in South Africa when I was working there. So I know that there's certain lines that you can cross, mm-hmm. but there's others that you absolutely mustn't. Things like trademarks. Don't go anywhere near a trademarked name. Um, and, and, you know, people get confused about what they can put on their book as a title because somebody else has got the same title. Yeah. And again, it's that whole thing of, if it's trademarked, stay the hell away. But if it's not, it's, it, you can use whatever words you like. They're out in the I know. I was going to, my last book was going to be called Harry Potter, but then I, you know, (laughs) well, that (laughs) couldn't use it. Yeah. That one you'd probably get into trouble for. But, I mean, if you spelt Harry <laughs> differently, like with an I-E at the, at the end, you could get away with it. You know, and there's, there's lots of ambiguity. And that's another thing with being an indie is you've got to know enough of that stuff to, at the very least, ask for forgiveness. That's right. If it's you cross that line, simple. it's like, oops, I can fix this. Don't sue me, bro. Yeah. Don't sue me. You can have the three dollars back i made (laughs) well that's the worst part that's going to happen is somebody is going to send you a cease and desist letter yeah and then you've got to make that decision do you do you stop using it or do you fight back and i think with most indies they probably just stop using it yeah that's the worst that's going to happen no one's going to come to you and put you in jail straight away so keep it in perspective it's not a train smash if you happen to have the same cover writing font and pictures and everything else is so close to this other person literally the worst it's going to do is they're going to get their lawyer to say hey listen stop using that i think as writers though we are great at worst case scenario catastrophizing things and like we create most beautifully disastrous stories in our minds like people are kicking in the door like give me all the copies of your book, man. <laughs> like I'm gonna burn them in a, a pile in the street for everyone to see, and I'm gonna point at you and say, "You did this." Yeah, yeah. and they like make me walk naked down the street and yell shame. <laughs> <laughs> shame. <laughs> oh no! So sorry. Oh, it's terrifying. Yeah, I always. I think I, that's what I, makes I, us good writers. Yeah, because we're insane. Um, <laughs> absolutely insane i think it is i i think there are different people for different things and i think creative artistic type people have brains that are just they go the boundaries are stretched further in our brains so we're like a normal person would run up into a wall where it hit like well they might like have a lawyer contact me (laughs) our brains the walls like out here and it's like well their lawyer will contact me well, the FBI might get involved. Well, the like there might be some somebody, you know, military coming and yeah. running over my apartment with a tank. And then it's Sharknado. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then Sharknado happens. End of yeah. the world explosion. We're all dead. Yeah. Because I used Harry Fotter as my <laughs> <laughs> Harry Fotter. Harry Fotter. P H. It's a P H O T T E R. I remember seeing a, a parody of Harry Potter a long time ago. It was called Barry Trotter. Barry Trotter. <laughs> so it. I mean, it happens. It happens. I bet it did well. And, I bet it did well. You know, um, what is that? What is it? How does that saying go? Um, to mimic someone is the highest form of flattery. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's Jacob kind of. Should be- yeah, that's where that's where they should be is to say, oh well, sweet, look at this. Now send them a cease and desist. I'm waiting for people to start mimicking me. Just like it, it's pretty easy to do. You just basically have to not shower for a while and uh, oh. <laughs> completely give up on your life. <laughs> just like no, <laughs> are you? And, and then you, and then you walk around and be like, are you are you imitating Matt Whiteside right now? Are you trying to be me like, right yeah. now? How could you tell? 
I could smell. I could smell. I could smell it. That's how I could tell. It's just smelling shit. <laughs> well, that's those guys with cups tell. shaking their cups, waiting for coins. Yeah, that's it. Begging on the side of the street. <laughs> okay. No, no, just no. I uh, love doing these interviews because I I never know where they're gonna go. Um, <laughs> this definitely went down a, a side alley. I know. Past it's the dump. Because we're you know. It's like uh, we we just kind of figure figure out who we are in yeah. the process of in the process of rambling. My one of my my favorite uh, quotes is from Michael Scott, where he says, "Sometimes I start a sentence and I don't even know where it's going to go. Like it's just <laughs> I don't know where the end of the sentence is, and that's kind of like what life is. I don't know how it's going to go. Yeah, and it's a series of random ramblings, isn't it? Correct. It yeah. is absolutely. It is. But getting back to the whole thing about creatives being their their minds and their imaginations being porous and allowing in so much of the the sort of nightmare aspect of of life, yeah, how it penetrates and it becomes this this big thing for us. It's it's something that preoccupies me for sure yeah, because true. I suffer quite badly from anxiety. Yeah. Um, I very seldom drive anymore. I can't remember the last time I climbed in behind the wheel of a car mm-hmm. because I suffer panic attacks. Yeah. And, you know, I know where the line is for myself and I've got a very supportive um, family that that know that, you know, there's some things I just, I know I can't do and there are other things that I'll push through. Mm-hmm. But we all struggle with that. We all yeah. struggle with those demons because we've lifted the veil. Yep. Being creative means to peer into the abyss. And it is hard for some people to to come back from that. Yeah. You know, as as a community, we need to reach out and support people when they have those moments of of darkness where they feel they're slipping over that edge because it's a real problem for for most of us we deal with that daily um so there's empathy for those anxieties that depression the the panic the the highs and the lows Mm -hmm. um and it's something we shouldn't take and 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 flog ourselves with because yeah. it makes us creative in the yeah. first place but it's also something that we shouldn't turn into our master right um we should do what we can and that creative outlet is what we can do yeah whether that's painting or photography making music writing books that creative outlet is a way to to keep cauterizing that that dark side yeah Definitely. And realizing that we're not alone in it, too, is huge. Yeah. I, I mean, writing can be an absolutely uh, isolated thing if we let it. But it's I mean, when we realize that we're all so similar and that we're all craving the same kind of connection. And then we just kind of pick our heads up and start talking to one another. It's like, oh, this isn't so terrible. <laughs> you know? why I like that. That's why I like the, the kind of community we've got going on Twitter is yeah. the people that you know, they just have to say, I'm having a really bad day yeah. or I'm going through some stuff yeah. or they'll, I mean, like me, every now and again, I'll go, where is everybody? And then yeah. they're there. Yeah. They're there. You know, and you feel better because you've made a little bit of a connection and it might be a social media connection, but for a lot of people, that's all they've got. And that's yeah. where they feel safest exposing themselves um, yeah. to other people, exposing their soul. Um. You know, it's hard to do that with people in person. And like I was saying earlier, the people closest to us are the ones that judge us the hardest. Yeah. So. Yeah, because, like, my family doesn't think I'm funny at all. And. (laughs) 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 No, I'm just kidding. They think I'm funny. It is scary, but it's also a whole new audience, right? And we get to, I think for me, because I deal with panic attacks and anxiety before. Mm-hmm. Um, it was something, I mean, I would literally was trapped in my house. Like I would look out the window and like, just start crying because I wanted to go outside, but I couldn't, like, I literally felt like if I went outside, I would be attacked and hurt. 
by some something, somebody. Yeah. And there was that fear that was irrational, completely irrational, but was so real to me that I had I just I'd laid in, I just laid back down in bed. And you know, and just I was like, okay, I guess I can't go outside. Yeah. But getting to a point now in my life where I, like I was telling you before, I'm about to go get up on stage in front of people and talk. That's a huge step. But it only came because I realized I I got I, I'm working constantly at getting rid of my ego and realizing that I really am not that important, <laughs> you know, because there was such a thing in me like I'm I'm the most important person in the universe. I'm the only person dealing with this. And once I got rid of that, it's like it's not that big a deal. Nobody gives a crap. Like writing did that for me, putting my stuff out there. YouTube did that for me because like as hard as I try to get people to watch and read and still like, you know, you still only get a small, very, very small portion of people who do. Mm. And then it's like, okay, they're on to the next thing or whatever it is. But even when you try your hardest to get people to look at you and like pay attention, you still won't get a lot of people. So for me, it was just like, oh, well, screw it. (laughs) Who cares? You know, yeah. like nobody's <laughs> every, nobody's watching anyway. Just go be myself. Yes, there's freedom in realizing that that anonymity returns the moment you close your mouth again. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's an amazing thing. In breathing, meditation and breathing. Yeah. Has changed my life because yeah. for so long I l- allowed those thoughts to attach and become mm-hmm. a reality. Now they're just weather. You know, it's like it's yeah. cloudy. Yeah. It's, it's sunny. It's raining. It's whatever. But it's not it. Ha- it's not me anymore. Yeah. You know, which is it's a profound thing. And it's taken a lot of time. And I'm still not per- like I don't I'm terrified of going up on stage. Terrified. The thought of it. But it's an, it's one of those steps. Right. It's like do it. It'll it'll, it'll probably suck. <laughs> but it might it might also be amazing. You yeah. Know? And that's the thing. It's like it's hundred percent of the chances you don't take. Yeah. And like I know it all goes back to that publish button, right? It all goes back to that publish button. It's the same thing. It's it's all comes back to how much you want to put yourself out there, Um, Mm -hmm. how much you want to get kicked in the face. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. That's exactly how I'm looking at it. (laughs) That's it. It's it's that. It's it's that painful for some people, yeah. and it's, it's that painful for some people to to just be on Twitter. It's yeah. that painful for some people to to put a post up, or to comment on something, or to to step outside their front door and pick the newspaper up off the the, the porch. Yeah. You know, there there have been days when I can't open the front door yeah. because I just can't face being the person that needs to be out there yeah. and i think we we get some kind of release from writing we can be in that world be the master of that world be in control of that world kill people raise them from the dead give them yeah. wings give them horns whatever we need yeah we're in control but out there we are nobody. We're a speck on the wall, and we have no control. Right. And that's the hardest part for me. It's like I can't be in control out there. I can't be in control in a car, mm-hmm. but I can be in control in my book. Yeah. As a writer, I've got what I can. Everything is there, and I can stop when I want to, and I can start when I want to. Yeah. So. It becomes completely therapeutic for sure. That's so cool. Um, or a crutch. Or a huge crush, or it can yeah. be absolutely debilitating. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully there's balance in it, though, right? And it's like you just yeah, use it as something. Place. Yeah, it's if it does become something that you just lean on all the time, then the rest of your body atrophies, your mind atrophies, and you become a it's the weird hermit that. <laughs> yeah. That's you. That's me. But you're not. You're not. You're not weird. Well, you are, but it's cool. You're one of the, <laughs> we're all weird. And I think you doing this is a huge testament to you trying and stepping out and like, because it is terrifying to record yourself. Oh yeah. This is way beyond my comfort zone. My son wanted to know, oh, when is it going to be on and what channel is it on, on YouTube? And I'm like, you are not watching this. This is on CBS. 
actually. I'll be. <laughs> I on, have Sunday a, just, on Sunday nights. On Sunday nights. Game of syndi- Thrones. <laughs> yeah, it's a syndicated program on HBO now. Oh, God. Um, yeah. Tens of twenties of people watch this show <laughs> around, the, around the world. You know what's funny is I actually did a TV interview last year for the launch of my book mm. on our local TV channel here. And I wasn't the least bit concerned about going on TV that day for a couple of reasons. I didn't know anybody in town because we'd literally only been here for about a year at that point. So I I had virtually no friends. No one knew me. They were all strangers. And it's a midday show and maybe five to ten people will watch it the whole way through. And I was in the last segment. So, you know, right before the the titles are going up the screen. I'm like, perfect. Let's do it. This one scared me because I, I see you've got like 451 subscribers and you get 14 views here and 50 views here. And I'm like, oh, God, this is going to be one of those things that people actually watch. How am I going to yeah. deal with this? I have some of the best numbers on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting up there. You're getting up there. This will be on the Internet forever. And it's good because there's so much wisdom in and I, I talk about this all the time. Anytime we can share vulnerabilities, yeah. we share the place where we can connect with another human being. Because yeah. if we're constantly showing our armor and showing that facade, there's no attachment points for people, you know? Yeah. There's nowhere right. another... He- yeah, if you're just always brushing people out, there's nowhere to, for somebody else to grab on and say, me too. Yeah, yeah. You know? And that's what we need. And humanity needs that so much yes. now in the world is places where we can hold on to each other and say me too yeah i get it <laughs> oh my god i connect with that and and you're not alone and yeah yeah we're all drowning we're in all drowning <laughs> in a right. sea of arms reaching to the sky which is turning brown i hope this is the thumbnail we're just doing this <laughs> this should be the opening sequence for our video yeah, there you go. <laughs> you flailing. Um, okay, so last word. Sure. All right. Something important. Don't blow it. This is... <laughs> oh, no pressure. Something that could change the world. Go. My books can change the world. Buy them today. No, I'm wow. kidding. <laughs> That's right. So um, big take home for anybody who's thinking about being a writer. Do your research. That's my big thing, is research. If you've got your research, you've got your facts. And you're going to get trolls. You're going to get people who come back and say, yes, but. But if you do enough work around the facts that you want to put on display in your book, then you'll know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you're writing fiction, you should at the very least know some of what you've put in there is based on research yeah so do your homework kids you do your homework of, you bunch of morons <laughs> <laughs> read a book <laughs> read a damn book right, oh uh, yes sure uh, what you don't see behind all of that is the big map of mars i said looking and like oh where can i put my little things that's so cool I even worked out the scale how far things are away from each other wow that's really cool what about the face, the, the human face on Mars? Did you watch that Ancient Aliens? No. Okay. There's a new, new season of Ancient Aliens was talking about Mars and the face okay. on Mars, and they found these faces on Mars. Check it out if you haven't. I will. It'll give me nightmares, but I'll take a look. <laughs> Cheryl Lawson, author of We Are Mars, thank you so much for joining the Uniweb interview show. You can get Cheryl's book on Amazon, US, UK, Wherever. Uh, wherever. There's a whole bunch of links on my website. We Tons are of links. And there will be links in the video description. Cheryl, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It was nice thanks to chat. For, thanks for coming on the Reading Rainbow. She <laughs> 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 can be anything. Talk to you later. All right, man. Take care. Bye.